My name is Michael Ian Black, and family to me is the ground we walk on. It doesn't necessarily mean that ground is always smooth. It is often rocky. It is sometimes sandy. Sometimes it's difficult to trudge through. But uh, it is the thing that supports us no matter where we are. And we cannot escape it for better or for worse, hopefully for the better. Hello and welcome to We Are Family. I am your host, Julia Dennison, and joining me today is actor, comedian, and author Michael Ian Black. You've seen him in hilarious films like Wet Hot American Summer, love that movie, This Is 40, adore that movie, and on TV programs like Inside Amy Schumer, Reno 911, and MTV's The State. His most recent books include A Better Man, A Mostly Serious Letter to My Son, as well as the children's book I'm Sorry. I wanted to have Michael on today to explore how his comedic mind shapes his parenting. So, Michael, welcome to We Are Family. Thanks. Good to be here. Um, let's start with your childhood, if that's okay, because usually if We Are Family, we talk about us as parents, but I feel like so much of being parents is shaped by our own childhood. I know your, your dad passed away when you were young, and I'm really sorry to hear that. Can you talk a little bit about your memories of your dad and describe growing up with your mom and dad and what your childhood was like generally? Sure. My parents divorced when I was, I think, five because my mom started shacking up with the neighbor lady down the street. And that's going to, you know, that's going to cause trouble in a marriage. I don't think it was a great marriage anyway. I mean, I don't think they were destined to survive as a couple. So I grew up with my mom and her partner and my brother and sister and her son. Then I would still see my dad generally every other weekend and he remarried. So I had a stepmother as well. He was a very nice guy, like a very sweet fella, kind of a nerd. I don't think he would have thought of himself that way, but he was. You know, he was like the first person I knew who had his own computer and he liked ham radio and he he painted little lead figurines from like Lord of the Rings. He wasn't a great dad in the sense that he did not know how to communicate uh, emotions. You know, he's very reserved. He was very like of his time. His father was a cop in New York City and he grew up in a household headed by a cop, you know, and, and he was so not that. He just didn't know how to talk to kids, you know. My mom, on the other hand, probably showed her emotions to a fault and hmm. often, always told us she loved us. And that was one of the things that I felt like she did really well. Like, you know, she, she really let us know, hey, you're loved, you're supported, I believe in you. And that was great. And I, and I took that lesson into parenting my own children. I think I fall somewhere in between the two of them. I definitely tell my kids I love them. I definitely try to have uh, a certain amount of emotional intelligence and, and I'm affectionate with them. But, you know, I'm also a little bit reserved. I don't let them know everything that I'm feeling, which is, I would imagine, is probably a good thing. I don't think you want to hear your parent pouring out their heart to you every second of every day, you know? So did you find comedy early? Was that something that you always felt like you were good at from a young age? Did you feel like you had to make your parents and your siblings laugh? Was that something that was part of your childhood? No, I mean, in retrospect, I think maybe there was a little bit of that going on. But I sort of stumbled into it. It was an accident. I had gone to see my brother... When he went to college, I visited him one weekend and we watched an improv group and I'd never seen that before. And I thought that seems like a really fun thing to do. Like when I go to college, I'm going to, I'm going to join the improv group. And then when I got to my college, there wasn't one. And, uh, I helped start a sketch comedy group there. And it, it's that group that started my career. And we had a mm -hmm. show on MTV and those People remain my good friends and collaborators. And yeah, I stumbled into a career in comedy. It wasn't my intention. So now your kids, Elijah and Ruth, they're 19, 21? That's exactly right. And so now they are becoming adults. Do you want them to kind of get into comedy? Have you? Did you feel like you, had to, you actively raised them to have a good sense of humor? Was that ever something you were conscious about? Oh, no, I don't give a shit what they do, you know? Um, <laughs> good. I really don't, you know? I chose an unconventional career path and... I remember 
you know, my mom was really dubious about it, as one would be. But she supported me, I think, to the best that she knew how to. And I would be loath to tell either of my kids what they should or shouldn't do because I, I chose such a dumb career. Like, I shouldn't be able to sit here and talk to you today you know, sitting in my house paid for with showbiz money. Like, that was so unexpected that it happened for me. So I chased after something that was unlikely. I was fortunate. And all I care about is that my kids are doing work that they find fulfilling in some way and that they have good experiences and that they don't feel like work is drudgery for them. Yeah, I don't care. You know, I don't, I don't care what they what that ends up being. That's great. I think that's the best approach. What has that been like? I'm the mother of a six year old. So the idea of having 19, 21 year old, it feels very far away, but I can imagine it just sort of flew by. What is that like seeing them become adults and letting go a little bit? And do you still feel like you have to parent them? How do you kind of cross that bridge as a parent? I think you'll find that your six-year-old at 21 will be totally recognizable to you. You know, that same, that person will be the same person. They will undergo some changes, of course, but the core of their personality will remain the same. And that has been kind of cool to see, you know, like the person who was a newborn is the same as the person who was a toddler, is the same as the person who is now a young adult. In my experience, I don't know that you stop parenting. I would imagine you never stop parenting. But parenting right. can mean a lot of different things. To me, my job as a parent is actually really simple. It's just to be that person that loves them unconditionally, that person that is always there for them, no matter what. I don't have to baby proof anymore. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to put little plastic guards on the cabinet so they, you know, they don't eat Drano. But, <laughs> but my essential job remains unchanged, you know, and I right. like that job. I like the job of loving somebody. That to me is, is really all that parenting is, you know. You know, you Absolutely. keep them, you keep them alive, so, you know, in the beginning and you, you, <laughs> you know, you, you, you help them as they need help and you set boundaries as they need boundaries, but all of it is in service of loving them. Absolutely. I cannot agree more. So in one of your stand-up albums, you talked about your kids as being very colicky babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if you kind of remember that time or if you feel oh, yeah. like it was all a blur or if you have any advice for parents, if you can rack your brain back back to that time? <laughs> Here's my advice. Both of my kids had colic. Both of them basically didn't sleep for four months. You know, it was like constant exposure to noise. There was no sleep. It was, you know, a, sensor, a certain amount of sensory deprivation. Like, it's awful. It meets, in my mind, the definition of torture. And my advice is this. In those moments when your baby is colicky and... You don't know how you're going to get through it. It is perfectly okay to hate your baby. In those moments, I hated my baby. Give yourself permission to be like, this is terrible. This little thing that won't shut up, that's an awful little thing. You're not a bad person for hating your life in that moment and for regretting every decision that led you to this moment. Like, I think that's okay, you know? <laughs> and then with the knowledge yeah. that this too shall pass. I didn't have that knowledge the first time, like when my son was born and he right. was colicky. Like it was, it just felt like this is, this is never ending. But it did end. Right. And then when my daughter had the same experience, it was like as awful as it was, and it was awful, particularly because we then had a two-year-old to deal with. Mm -hmm. There was some solace because we knew it would end. But in those moments, yes. I, I hated both of them. And I hated that my wife. So and I hated myself. <laughs> and I hated everything. I just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that is so relatable. You know what? That's I feel like a parents that we're constantly trying to re reassure parents that that's okay. You don't always have to love every part of no, um. It's of one of parenthood. the things that I felt like parenting is is every experience that you can have, and it's an intense experience, particularly when they're young, and it's okay for it to be a bad experience at times. You don't have to feel guilty mm -hmm. about that. You can have bad times being a parent. Mm -hmm. And I think especially with women, there's a lot of 
guilt associated with that. Like somehow you're a bad yep. mother if this mm-hmm. is like a terrible moment for you. No, it's like it's a perfectly normal human experience and it's okay. And you're not a bad mother and you're not a bad person. And you're not a bad father. It's just like, yeah, this sucks. And, uh, and let it suck. <laughs> yep, let it suck. I know we had Ben Feldman on this podcast and my favorite quote was he was like, you know what, man, fuck babies. And I was like, I know, fuck babies. And I was like, oh God, I'm like an editor at parents and here I am saying fuck babies. But honestly, sometimes it's okay, like you say, to just be like, this sucks. I hate this right now. Oh, yeah. And know that there is an end in sight and also parenthood can be wonderful and it can be freaking sucky Yeah. at the same time. It's like one, it's not sort of like mutually exclusive no, <laughs> somehow. No, no. I, and in fact, the, like I started writing children's book. My first idea for a children's book that I wanted to write was called I Hate My Baby. I never wrote it. But now in retrospect, I mean, I st- there's I kind still of feel time. Like maybe, I, yeah, I sort of feel like maybe I want to revisit that. <laughs> so you having two kids is always, I only have one. So it's always interesting. To, but I have a sister. It's always interesting to me, the whole kind of like nature versus, versus nurture um, observation. Did you find that their personalities are very different and how do they differ and have they changed since they were little colicky babies, obviously, but you know, in what ways? Their personalities are very different and they have remained consistent from the moment we met them. You know, one of the things that I sort of found funny is that my wife and I were both like, you know, good little progressive parents and we're going to expose our kids to you know, our son to dolls and our girl to, you know, race cars. And we're going to be sort of genderless parenting and all of that. But what was funny to me was how both of them immediately fell into the boy girl stereotypes. Like my son only wanted to play with trains and my daughter only wanted to play with, you know, little dolls. It was kind of humbling, you know, It, it made me think, you know what? There is something to the nature part of the nature nurture argument. There is some sort of biological disposition for boys to generally be one way and girls generally to be in the other. But those terms are very general because there's sort of an average of behaviors that boys may fall into and an average of behaviors that girls may fall into. But there's also plenty of room in between. So one way in which... Mm -hmm my son and daughter defied the stereotypes is my son for all of his boyish early interests was always more sensitive my daughter was always more aggressive and physical there was definitely a combination of of those sort of traditionally male and female characteristics oh yeah i totally relate and it's funny because when people are like talk about boy moms versus girl moms or like oh i have a boy i'm like okay but my daughter is very rambunctious so like Mm -hmm. i don't know if you can say one thing or another but i'm exactly the same i was like like determined to raise her gender neutral as gender neutral as possible but it's like all barbie and lol dolls over here so i but it's hard to you know it's like either there maybe there's nature but honestly it's probably a lot of very insidious societal norms that just get in there early i feel like you know oh, no it's question not, not in our control <laughs> yeah i mean they live in the culture too and that mm-hmm. culture is just it's the water we swim in and it's it's unavoidable yeah and that's not necessarily a bad thing it's not necessarily a good thing it just is what it is you could sort of bash your head against it trying to mm-hmm. you know not deal with the culture you could go live on a kibbutz somewhere but you know. You're a big poker enthusiast, right? So one, do you feel like you have a good poker face? And two, do you think that you bring that into parenting at all? Well, I'll give you a, a little lesson in poker. There <laughs> okay. is no really such thing as a poker face. You'll never okay. encounter a poker player who does this when they have a good hand. And this right. when they have, you know, I'm, I'm it is a podcast, so I'm smiling broadly. So, <laughs> okay. Or, or this when they have a bad hand and I'm frowning and, and close to tears. People are good at lying, I find. For somebody who like makes his living observing human behavior, I'm a terrible judge of when somebody's telling the truth or lying. Like, I'm gullible. So I rely on other skills at the poker table. Does it translate okay. to parenting? No. I'm going yeah. to say no, not at all. It, it, it really doesn't. Those are two totally separate skills and happily so. The aim of poker is deception more than anything else. And mm. if you bring that into parenting, I suspect you're not going to be a very successful parent. Right. Okay. Which is a good segue into your series of children's books that are that all begin with I'm like, I'm bored. I'm sad. I'm worried. Mm-hmm. Newest one is I'm sorry. 
those feel all like titles that are the opposite of a poker face. And it's all yeah. about sharing. It seems like it's all about sharing your feelings. What was your kind of motivation behind this series of children's books? Well, the first one's called I'm Bored. And it was just came out of my daughter just constantly complaining how bored she is, <laughs> how I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored. So I wrote a little book about it. And then there were these three characters in the book. There's the little girl, a flamingo, and a potato. And I really liked those characters and I wanted to do something else with them. And for some reason, it took me forever to like just do the obvious thing, which is just come up with another sort of emotion that they're exploring. And so that's what I did. And, and I wanted to pick emotions that maybe are kind of underrepresented in children's literature. And I wanted to give them a take that I felt like I wasn't seeing that much. So for example, mm -hmm. in I'm Sad, you know, the flamingo's bummed out, but we never find out exactly why. She's just sad. Mm -hmm. And the message is basically like, we're not trying to cure your sadness here. We're not trying to make you happy here. We're letting you literally like sit in your sadness and we're going to support you in it. And we love you if you're sad. We love you, you know, however you're doing. Like your mm -hmm. sadness is just part of who you are today. And that's cool. And, and we'll be here for you with a lot more jokes than that. But that's, you know, the, that's, that's, <laughs> that's essentially the book. And, you know, that was a message I, I felt like maybe I, I need to hear sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Like it's good lessons for kids, but it's also good lessons for us as adults and relationships. And we talk about that a lot when you, you know, you're in a relationship or with a friend and they're feeling sad, you know, you don't automatically need to solve it for them. Sometimes no. you just need to acknowledge it. Yeah. And you can't, you can't be solve there. it. I mean, that's one right. of the things that I feel like it took me forever to learn. My job as a friend or a partner or a parent isn't to solve your problems. My job mm -hmm. is to support you in whatever way you need support. I, I can yes. help you if, you if you're looking for solutions. Yeah, I can, I can help you try to find them, but that m m may not always be possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I've talked about it before on the podcast, but Lisa Damore is a child psychologist and she talks about, especially when parenting teens, she talks about being a potted plant parent. So your kids want you to be there for them and like in the room, but just like they may not acknowledge you, they may not need you to acknowledge them, but as long as they know that you are in the room and you're not going anywhere. <laughs> That's a great so metaphor. And it's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly, yeah. was my, exactly my experience as the parent of a teenage of teenagers who really didn't seem to care for either of us very much. But That's you know, hard. one That's got to be is, hard personally. It is hard at times personally, but I also felt like I had a much easier time dealing with it than my wife, who I think took it really personally. But mm -hmm. I I felt like if they are acting like they hate us, from everything that I know, and admittedly that's not very much. It means that they're exactly along the sort of developmental place that they're supposed to be. So something's going right, you know? Like teenagers famously hate their parents. So if, if they're like a teenager and they're on track and they're hating us, I'm like, okay, great. Like, it seems like that's the way it's supposed to be. It still sucks, but it's like colic. Like this too shall end at some point. You sort of have to trust that. Right. It's just like another milestone that you track. It's just the yeah. teenage. You milestone. find yourself sometimes hating them back. You're like, this fucking kid. You know what I mean? But Aha. It's like back but, to the colicky baby thing. <laughs> yeah. But you're also, as a parent, on that same developmental line. Like you're also supposed right. to, in turn, hate them at times because at a certain mm -hmm. point, they're going to want to leave. And you don't want to be that person who's so in love with their kid that it's going to kill you when they right. walk out that door. Like you want to be able to say, good, mm. go. <laughs> so maybe that's why it happens, right? Like I it's actually like it's think, humans. <laughs> I actually think it does. I actually think we're sort of set up that way. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, so moving along to your, to your latest book, um, mm -hmm. A Better Man, A Mostly Serious Letter to My Son. Can you talk us through a little bit about your motivation there, but also the title and the premise of the book? Um, are, were you really writing it for your son or is it also for like all the parents who are going through similar things? The book grew out of um, a f uh, an anger and a frustration, an outrage really, that I had with the state of gun control in this country. Mm -hmm. It was directly motivated by the Parkland shooting in Parkland, Florida a few years ago. 
um, high school shooting. And, you know, when those things happen, I tend to get on my Twitter soapbox and start screaming into the void about it. This time when it happened, I started asking what I thought was an obvious question, which is why is it always boys pulling the triggers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is it about boys? And then out of the blue, the New York Times contacted me. They're like, hey, do you want to write an op-ed about this? And I was like, not really. I don't think I can. I don't think I'm you know, qualified or smart enough. They're like, but, but, but we're the New York Times. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, then, yeah, I guess I will. <laughs> so my ego like, wouldn't allow me not to do it. I was like, oh, yeah. No, like, I, okay, I, fine, New York Times. Yeah, I want to be in the New <laughs> York guess. Times. Okay. That's basically. <laughs> and then... When that came out, a publisher came to me and said, do you want to expand it into a book? And I said the same thing. I was like, not really. Like, I don't think I can. And they were like, but we'll pay you not very much money. And I was like, keep talking, keep talking. I went into it reluctantly because I just, I didn't feel qualified. I didn't want to come across as a know-it-all. I didn't want to come across as an activist um, the last thing the world needs is more actors who are activists. But I did feel like I had something to say because and you had a platform and an audience and people who would sit up and listen well, that, to you. So you know, the more people are saying these things, the better. That was probably. the argument that the publisher was like. They're like, "Yeah, you're, we know you're not like an academic, but you have a platform and you have a voice, and maybe you know you could be helpful." And I was like, "Fine, I'll write a book." You know, <laughs> and it was mm. their idea that I write it to my son, and I was a little bit resistant mm. at first. Because, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it, I think maybe it scared me a little bit and maybe it made me feel like it was too close to home. But mm -hmm. I'm so glad I did because it really let me, it really gave me a focus. It really gave me the ability to speak to one person um, very specifically and to open up my heart to him and have the conversation with him that I wish my own dad had had with me. And so it is mostly serious, you know, there are jokes in it, but it's, it's, it's a mostly serious letter um, about what I um, think it means to be a guy. What do you hope people take away from it? From it? Because it feels like it's, there's a real universal appeal, not just parents to learn a lot from the book, but just us as a society on how we view manhood and being a boy today. My central premise I think is pretty basic, which is men get a bad rap in the culture. Um, a lot of it deserved. We do a lot of shitty things, but there's nothing inherently toxic about being a guy. And in the conversation, in the criticism of men in the culture, I keep, I feel like I keep hearing the phrase, we need to redefine masculinity. And I just disagree. I don't think we do. I think there's a lot that's really good about traditional masculinity and the attributes we traditionally associate with men. My premise mm -hmm. isn't that we need to redefine it, only that we need to expand it, only that we need to open up mm -hmm. the possibilities of what it means to be a man in the exact same way that we did with women uh, mm -hmm. over the last half century. We have redefined womanhood in a way that has been so amazing uh, for women and for the larger culture. And it's time we have that same conversation about men. And what was your son's reaction to it? Oh, he didn't read it. How have you kind of talked to him about it as you were like, you know, <laughs> I said, I wrote you a book. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll read it. I'll read it when you're dead, basically, is what he said. Oh, God. <laughs> but I will say no. this. I will say that there's nothing in that book that would surprise him. There's nothing that right. I have said to him in that book that I hope I haven't said to him in some way, shape, or form uh, in person, you know, over the course of his life. Yeah. I, just, I just put it all down on paper. But he doesn't read. What are you kidding? He's 21 <laughs> years old. <laughs> right. Um, and what about as a dad to a daughter? How, what kind of, like, thoughts have you had in terms of, like – advice to other parents, dads of daughters out there and anything you've tried, anything you feel like you, you should have done differently or anything you were conscious to make sure that you did do as a dad of a daughter? I don't know that I made any real distinction between parenting my son or my daughter. The way I think of it is I'm not parenting a gender. I'm parenting a person and yeah. they need certain things depending on who they are. 
Um, some of that might have something to do with them being a girl or a boy, but mm -hmm. mostly it's just what they need as, as individuals and as people in any given moment. You know, my daughter has had struggles. My son has had struggles. My wife and I have both had struggles and that's mm -hmm. just what life is. And you just, you deal with each of those things as they come along. But I don't know that I, I don't know that I did anything differently with her than I did with him. Maybe I should have. I don't yeah. know. I mean, I just, no. I don't know. And what do you think being a father has taught you about yourself? Do you think you've, you've changed? Obviously, everybody changes when they become a parent. But are you the father that you thought you might be before you were a father? I was unsure what the role of father was. You know, my own dad, because he died so young and because he was kind of um, unavailable in a lot of ways, you know, I, he didn't provide the best example. So I didn't. I didn't really know how I would approach it. And it scared me the way I think, you know, parenting scares everybody. But I tried to trust that a lot of people, even dumber than myself, have gone through this experience and have somehow been okay. And mm -hmm. when my kids were born and they were annoying and horrible, I was wise enough to trust that I would eventually fall in love with them and I trusted that I would figure it out well enough as I went along and I think that's been the case I mean I, I certainly would never say I'm anything other than an average dad but parenting ultimately does give you back as much as you put into it or more it really mm -hmm. for me has connected me not only to my kids, but I feel like it connects you to generations, to time itself. Like mm -hmm. you just, you, you really feel, I really feel like I'm linked in some way to the much grander experience of humanity for having parented. Um, I like I don't that. Think, yeah, that's. Yeah, I don't think you have to be a parent in this world. I certain, you know, I don't. Mm. I don't. I think that's a, a choice everybody should be able to make. For me, it's been really enriching and and great. But I also would like to have a lot more disposable income. So you weigh the two. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Costs money. Um, so the last question question we ask everybody. It's obviously been a traumatic couple of years, I think, especially for parents and especially for kids. Good gracious. Um, what hopes do you have for the future of your your own family the next as we go into the next year or two? Well, um, both of my kids are in college. I hope that they find themselves pointed in a direction that they're excited about that gives them purpose and ignite something in them that will take them through the next, you know, part of their lives. I hope they just open themselves up to as many experiences as possible. You know, one of the great things about being that age, you know, late teens, early twenties, is that you're just out there for the first time and the world is a is a vast place and i hope that that they you know dive into that vastness it's the best time of your life to do that and to just you know drink as much of it as you can michael this has been great chatting thank you so much for coming on we are family it's been wonderful to talk to you oh my pleasure julia thanks for having me be sure to follow We Are Family on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen so you don't miss an episode. And we'd love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. You can also find us online at parents.com slash wearefamilypodcast. Tune in to all our episodes during this season with Michael Ian Black, Phil Rosenthal, and Tamara Mowry housley And if you missed any of our previous episodes in season one and two, they're waiting for you right now. This season of We Are Family is presented by me, Julia Dennison, and produced by Jim Hankey. Editing is by Jason Mack, and thanks also to our production team at Pod People, Rachel King, Matt Sav, and Danielle Roth. <laughs>